Hello and welcome to the Cabin Boy Knits Woolcast, coming to you deep from the Canadian forest. This is Christopher. And this is the other guy. Jamie. This episode we have a lot to talk about. I've got a couple of books I want to talk about specifically. One of them is from Arne and Carlos, and the other one is from Lars Reigns. And we're going to talk about Icelandic sheep having to do with my whip. That's a work in progress. You have a whip, I have a whip, and I have an FO I want to talk about as well. You've also got mail. Yes, I have mail, and I have, want to show you what was in my dye pot over the last week. And I'm going to show you what was in my kitchen. Oh, and it smelled so great. We also have a giveaway that we want to give away. <laughs> <laughs> so grab your favorite drink, sit back, and we'll tell you our story. In the last episode, I was talking about my sweater drama, and, <laughs> and it was all about the pattern and making some assumptions, and so I got that straightened out. What I need to do now was find the right yarn for the sweater. I think I... I don't remember drama, but okay. <laughs> it was all about this drama. <laughs> yeah, as soon as my mouth started opening, talking about it, I think your ears closed. You didn't want to listen to it which I don't blame you, I wouldn't want to either. So what I did was I got my yarn that I was trying to figure out what's the perfect yarn for this. And I thought to myself, uh, self, the alpaca and merino would be great. And so I had some from Custom Woolen Mill. And so I thought, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna dye that. I've got a couple of pots going right now and I'm going to dye it in my um, leaves and bark. Oak oak leaves and bark. And so this is the color that has come out. And I love it. I love it. You yeah, said it looks vintagey. It looks very, it, yeah, it does. That's what I thought. It looks like, it's, it's going to look like some kind of a very vintage color sweater. Yeah. And it's soft. It's golden. It is golden. And it, what I think it looks like is the color, I would call it almost like a, a camel, like a, a camel jacket. Oh yeah, you did mention that. It lo it almost does look like camel. Yeah. yeah. What is a camel wool? Camel what? Camel. Yeah. Actually, you know what? We're gonna put that. We're gonna. I we, I want to talk about that in another episode. I want to talk about because a lot of people now are using uh, mm -hmm. fiber from camels in knitting. It's coming back again. It's definitely popular again. And opossum. Opossum. <laughs> yes. Because I did get you wool with opossum. <laughs> that's there. right. It was very special. It was special. Yeah, that's a, that's actually an interesting topic as well. Yeah. Um, so we can talk about that. Yeah, unusual unusual blends. That yes. Could be a, yeah. Yeah. There's a whole list of them. Another episode. Another episode. <laughs> so what I'm doing now is I'm going through uh, the pattern. It is again by Pickles. Pickles. Um, and it is the <laughs> sweeter dill. No, and it's it's the sailor sweater. And the other thing that I did was in this. In the pattern, it shows a sweater, and it's kind of—it's a little bit. Um, it's got an or I guess an orangey or rusty hue to it, but it's it's similar to this. Okay. And they use a light stripe in it. I'm going to use a dark stripe. Yeah, that'll look good. And, but what makes it a sailor sweater? Um, <laughs> because the, I, there's stripes in it. I don't know. <laughs> you could only wear it when you're sailing. Yes, it's for sailing. Like fishing, fisheries. I don't think those are the sailors that they oh. were picking. I, act, I, I just thought it was like mm, so, sailor sailors, like oh, <laughs> as opposed to fishing sailors, fishermen sailors. I'm just gonna grab my drink. <laughs> <laughs> Getting all flustered. Okay, so that is it. So I'm going to, I think I'll plow through this, and I'll you, keep showing you. Yeah, you did quite a bit in a short period of time. That's great. I'm trying to see what I'm trying to do is catch up with my Thursday night gang because mm. uh, they're much further ahead than I am. Right, right. Your sweater knitting group. Yes. And here's the other thing. When I'm knitting this sweater, I'm already thinking about my next sweater that I'm knitting, which I don't think it's not fair to this sweater when I'm knitting oh it. Gosh. So my mind wanders and there's another sweater that I, I'm, well, there's a couple sweaters I really want to knit next. Yes. So my mind is going there, but I do, I'm looking forward to um, 
getting through and, and knitting this yeah. sweater as well. And I've had sweaters in my mind for, yeah, many weeks, but one in particular. It's, it's, it, I keep going back and forth. It's in my mind. I'm going to, yeah. You've had that, like, I think that concept of that yes. sweater, you've had that for a while now mm -hmm. in, in, in there. It's going to happen. One day. It's going to happen. Oh, yeah. No, it will happen for with sure. A sweater that I knitted. And is that going to be your Rhinebeck sweater? Oh, I. <laughs> I'd love it to be a Rhinebeck sweater. Whenever that's going to happen, when's Rhinebeck? I don't know. Well, hopefully I'm next year. Player. Hopefully next year. But at least that will give you a deadline, so that you sure. can make it happen for for then. So yeah, if you think about it that way. And you talked about this sweater, because you mentioned this would be a wonderful sweater to knit with your all of your amazing colors. Yeah, I think that would. I whipped this nice. one together an hour ago. <laughs> oh, no, I, this was a gift. It was gifted to me. It's. Yeah. yeah, it's nice though. Look, it looks great. Yeah. So that is my whip. Now you have a whip. I have a whip. Isn't that exciting? Because I've never had a whip. <laughs> well, That's not had true. Whips. You've never I've talked about I've your whip. I've never talked about a whip. So this is my whip. You can see that. Ooh la la. So it's a cowl I'm knitting for my niece. Um, she's hoping to have a, a matching hat, cowl, and mittens for Christmas. So. You knitted the hat, which is over there somewhere, um, and I'm trying to match this cowl to the hat that you knitted that had um, like a natural cream and one of your dark wools, and yeah. I'm trying to replicate stripes. And um, I'm all about, um, I'm just sort of winging it. I like my creative process because I just use logic as opposed to patterns because I don't know how to read a pattern, but don't follow what I'm doing. But <laughs> all I need to do is a count, and I guess a count based on another cowl. And I'm just going to um, wait, because I was going to do this in, in multiple stripes. But what I've decided, I went one, two, 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 one, one, two, 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 one. And then I'm going to just add another big two, three inches of beige <laughs> and then repeat this pattern and so forth and so on. So it's a creative process as I go, because it's all up here. I will say, and I've, I've mentioned this before, that you are, even though you're talking about how random all of this is, you're still, when it comes to the knitting aspect of it, you're a perfectionist. Like you're very... Well, this um, is true. Yeah. This is true. And if you've watched, you know, The Queen Gambit, my yes. mind kind of works like that. Only I knitting. love The Queen Gambit. So the calculations are just up here and the process is just up here. <laughs> well, The Queen we'll Gambit, with that. I think that has started me... <laughs> I, I've been playing chess every night now before I go to bed. You have, and um, and I love it. I miss it so much because I used to play a lot when my son was little. Yes. Um, and here's a, can I say a proud father moment right now? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> so I, my my son was a exceptionally he was a great player, and he was ranked in the top uh, in Canada when he was in grade one. Um, like he was playing he was oh. playing other grade ones. But he was uh, provincially, he was at the provincials, and then he was nationally ranked. He was, a, and he had a chess coach and all that stuff. So it was fun playing chess with my son. So, um, and then he surpassed me. In, like, he could clean my clock. And um, but it is nice to, because it brings back all those memories of, yeah. of when we play chess. And I'm hoping he picks chess up again, too, and so that we can play well, chess. I'm, and, and that to prompt him is, I, I don't, I've never played chess, so I've already put it out there that he needs to teach me how to play chess. So that's the sort of poke to get him. Yes. Doing chest again. Yeah. So, oh, yeah. And so where were we about your whip? The way my mind works, just like yes. hers. It's just the math is just sh yeah. computes in my brain. So, um, yeah, this is, I love this wool. It's Icelandic. It is it's just, gorgeous. It's, it's, it's really nice. I, I really love this wool. It's Icelandic. Um, yeah. And this darker, this darker was, um, I don't even know. I grabbed it off the shelf somewhere back there. There's <laughs> colors and I wanted a charcoal and there it is uh, to match the hat that you did. So. That's pretty much it. Yeah, it's really nice. But we should, you also got something in the mail. I did. It has to do with Icelandic. I did. Yep. It is right here. Mm -hmm. And it is, so we're going to open it up. So this is from Long Way Homestead. And I've talked about this in prior episodes. Every month we get a new breed of mm -hmm. sheep. Mm -hmm. And it just so happens that I chose, party. and it just so happens that I chose Icelandic. Uh, for the base for my cowl, and that shows up in the mail, Icelandic. So that brings us to see. So even though it comes, it's, mm -hmm. even though it's it's vacuum packed, 
Um, look at how nicely it fluffs up. I know, I keep thinking it's like smoked meat, but it's not. It's <laughs> your wool. <laughs> that is that. Oh, that is. Isn't that nice? That's really nice. Why did that, that almost feel softer? Oh, no, no. Okay. No, they both, well, oh, no, this it's, is it's like nice. nice. Yeah, this is from, Where this is, is from, from Manitoba. Oh. Yeah, and that's fantastic. It's, it's, it's fantastic. Uh, well, I don't, I don't know if I've talked about Icelandic sheep in prior episodes, I can't remember, but I, it's worth talking about again because I love mm -hmm. Icelandic sheep. They're fantastic. And it would make sense. I mean, they are a hardy sheep, are they not? And yeah, or very much Canadian, so. I mean, they're Icelandic, so for Canadian um, climate and... and um, oh, they're great for Canadian yeah. climate. Yeah, they were actually one of the first sheep to come over to North America, came over oh. to Ontario, the province that we live in. And they're one of the purest breeds. Yeah, they're one of the purest breeds because the Vikings brought them over to Iceland, and then Iceland basically did not permit any other sheep to come in. So for so they've been able to maintain their pure breed. Yeah, and for from so long. and from and from what I know as well, they they did at some point try to because they always try to improve the stock and breed, and they've tried a few things that didn't quite work, and then they they stopped all of that and they they purity of the sheep because they were just great as they were. So a few fine tuning of some genes, but they've kept it so pure with no other, um, they're not interbred with other sheep at all. Yeah, so when you think about it, it's exciting because when you think about this yarn that we're looking at, this is very similar to the yarn that you would get from sheep 1100 years ago. Which is unbelievable. Because, it, yeah, it's fantastic. And yeah. so it's wonderful. And they're, you know, back, in the day, um, they used to use the Icelandic sheep for, for milk, and then meat, and for and for, the fiber. for fiber as well. Um, but it's and that's not often. And many many sheep are one or the other. Are they not? Like one's probably, well, like some meat yeah. meat yeah. sheep, not necessarily the best fiber because they're raised for the sh the, the meat as opposed to the fiber. Um, so to have that combination in one sheep is is. Yeah, it's it's great, it's rare. but it's well. Yeah, I mean, you can make the thing is I, I go back. You're making this very difficult now for me because I I love all breeds of sheep, and um, the fiber I think you can use for different things. So you're right. So if you were to say, um, you know, you wanted a soft, my uh, a very low micron count and a very soft wool and mm -hmm. something that's specifically bred for for um, luxury fiber. Absolutely the case, but you know you can use. I, I'm convinced that you can use uh, fiber from from most breeds of sheep for something. Well, right? absolutely, because I mean it's insulation, yeah. it's carpeting, it's it's you know outdoor oh, yeah, clothing. Like there's all things. kinds of yeah outerwear socks. Yeah, more of durability. So yeah, there's different yeah. fibers, different wools, different sheep for different. Um, yeah. Different now let's talk about the reasons. fiber. Okay. Let's <laughs> talk about the fiber. <laughs> the fiber. I mentioned microns. I, me I, rent, I mentioned microns. So it's interesting when we're talking about Icelandic sheep, there's actually two, um, the fiber is coming from two different parts of the, um, of the sheep. It's from the outer and the inner yes. layer. And so the outer la layer is probably around 27 to 31 microns. Um, so it's itchier. It's, it's itchier against your skin. And then underneath it, this is where the, the soft magic happens. It could be anywhere from 19 to 21 microns. It's nice and soft. Yeah, and I wouldn't even I wouldn't even say really scratchiness at all because it's no, pretty, absolutely it's pretty not. soft. And this, obviously, the combination of the outer layer and the inner layer is lopy, and that's only Icelandic wool is lopy. And so, and, and yeah, you're knitting with lopy. You didn't know I knew that. <laughs> and and, you, and so how they make lopi is they take the outer layer and the inner layer is that and, what I said? and take it together. Yes. <laughs> That's what I just said. <laughs> Thanks for clarifying for me, um, in case it wasn't clear. Yes. Yeah, the combination is the lopi in here. Yes, it's beautiful, love it. It's beautiful. Um, what I know, what I know is that um, nowadays, well, up until the 1940s, the um, Icelandic sheep were primarily used um, for uh, milking. Yeah. Our milk products, and um, I guess one you would produce about a liter of milk per day, and they would wean off the young ones. They would wean them off after two weeks, and then for the next six weeks, two weeks, wow, two weeks, yeah. And after for the next six weeks, they would milk them daily, um, and they would produce this milk. And they also, you know, of course, um, it was cheese 
and butter and also skier. You know the yogurt you get and spelled S-K-Y-R? I just yes. thought it was a brand. I didn't even know that that was actually, that's the name of the product, which um, they were making this for hundreds of years as we know they've had the Icelandic soup. They were making that for hundreds of years. So it's, they eat it like a yogurt, but um, it's technically like a sour milk cheese. Mm -hmm. And it's the consistency of a Greek yogurt. So they would traditionally have it either um, with breakfast, they would add milk and sugar as a dessert, or add it to oatmeal, porridge, and mix it. Um, and that's, that is skier. Wow. <laughs> He's not as excited as I am. No, you, I, you know what I was thinking? Because <laughs> we were watching, Iceland is definitely on my bucket list for, I really want to go to Iceland. So Well, we were there. Well, we were only at the airport. A pit stop. And, and I filled my um, suitcase <laughs> with <laughs> yarn. Oh my gosh, I bought so much yarn at the, and it was, it was so inexpensive yes. as well. And I bought a beautiful Icelandic hat knitted in a Viking for my new little... Oh, that was beautiful. Great. That was really nice. Was like my, my niece's little baby, the first grandnephew, great-nephew? Sure, I'm going to go with that. I'm a great-uncle now. Well, we know him. Well, great. Well, obviously, uncle. that's just <laughs> obvious that you're great-uncle. But... but I bought this beautiful little Icelandic hat, so it was a great little pit stop, but we need to spend some time. Oh, there. I definitely want to spend some time there. Yeah, it's... it's um, Looks like an absolutely wonderful place. And the Icelandic sheep now, today, they're mostly used, they are uh, obviously for the fiber, but um, I forget what the percentage was. It's not, it's not the, that huge of a percentage when you think about it in the, in the big picture of things. I forget how much fiber, something like 15% or something of, of the sheep <laughs> produced the wool. Do you know in our last episodes when we are talking and then we say something that's um, wrong. Wrong. And I pla flashed the, the words uh, that's across. Right. But I know that <laughs> we'll be flashing the correct is, percentage you know, across. Everybody knows Icelandic point. sweaters and Icelandic wool. So I really thought it was it was a much smaller percentage than I thought. Yeah. They're mostly, they're bred for the meat. And it's it's like a delicacy. It's some of the best, uh, most delicious lamb that you'll ever have is from the Icelandic sheep in yeah. throughout Europe or if you have it out there. And it's also, they're not, they're not, um, they're not like bred by the like uh, the numbers that you would think so it's still very much uh, a specialty thing to have Icelandic lamb and you know what do you know what month I want to go to to Iceland September and why is that because during the summer the Icelandic sheep go off into the and play on the hills that's and, right and then uh, so they're up there playing for a couple months and then they come back and then they heard the they heard them in um, in September, and so right. you can go and help help do that. That would be that would be a lot of fun. And that's because, as we mentioned, they're so hardy, and they could they're out there, and they're not grain fed or anything else. It's all natural. They they just they eat a lot of the grasses and everything that's out yeah. there, and it makes them that much more pure. So I would encourage if you have not ever knit with um, Icelandic wool, seek it out. It's really great. You can find it if you're going to a festival, a large festival. Oftentimes there will be Icelandic uh, farms that have a Icelandic sheep. It's really worth um, it because it's such a wonderful fiber. And um, there's also what I'll put in the show notes is a link to the, I think it's the North American um, Icelandic Sheep Association. I'm getting that wrong, but I'll put that link there as well. Um, so you can go to that. And then also the Canadian uh, cooperators, um, Wool Co-op, the Canadian Wool Co-op, also has a, a, a link to all of the farms as well, um, based on sheep breed. Okay. So, and I do, I would love to. I'm thinking that my sweater, my sweater in my mind, <laughs> will be made with Icelandic and one of your wonderful colors, which I'm, I'm, I keep flip flopping between the golden, the beautiful golden yellow, or pink. Can I tell you something about this? It doesn't have mm -hmm. to be one or the other. Do you well, know why? I might add a couple. Uh, I know. Icelandic is gorgeous by itself, and it comes in a, in a number of different colors. It's, oh, yeah. That's yeah. right. But it is also great for dyeing. It's a wonderful, wonderful fiber to dye. Yes. And, and you mentioned the natural colors. It's one of the breeds that comes, I think, in the most numerous natural colors. Yeah. From deep, dark browns and fawns and up into charcoal and grays. Um, yeah, a whole mix in pure white as well. Yeah. 
So again, if you haven't, if you ever never knit with this, um, I encourage you to go out and, and knit with it. Um, oh, so, you know, when I think about Icelandic sheep and we talk about Lopi, there is one person in particular I think about. Who's that? <laughs> Lars Reigns. Oh, why is that? <laughs> because he, well, I, not only does he have Lopi on his license plate, uh, oh, but he no. also, um, I, he's published a few books on Lopi knitting. And I want to talk about that next. Oh, great. Now he's going to, he's going to see, well, if my knowledge compares <laughs> and if I did make a few faux pas in my facts. So this is the, the, the most recent book that I have of his is Modern Lopi. Um, and if the glare is on there, I'll try to fix it and put up a picture. But I do think that uh, Lars put the, the right uh, picture on the cover because I love this sweater and I love the colors of this sweater. You've mentioned that. And this is on my bucket list for sure to, to knit this sweater. I love it. Um, and so Lars is Canadian. Yes. And he moved to the United States uh, because of school. I think he was doing his PhD or master's in, I think it was in music. And as any music student does, you end up becoming a cop. So he's a police officer. And he was a New York police officer. And then, and now as any retired New York police officer does, he teaches. And so he, he teaches students, um, I, both academically and also um, knitting as well. And how, come I, 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 how come I just had an image of him in an emergency and, and he's got to put down his knitting needles <laughs> and, and reach for something else in an emergency? Well, it's quite possible. His baton or something. It's like, oh, wait, those are my knitting needles. <laughs> I don't know. That's sorry. Lars also has an amazing uh, wit about him. He's, I, yeah, I love him to death. He's such a great guy. So this is a, a, a terrific book. I took one of his classes and we knit up a hat. Um, it was the Fjord, uh, West Fjord hat. And that was a fun knit as well. So he's, uh, this is a great book. I recommend this if you like Lopi knitting. Um, and there are, there's something in here for everyone. There's all kinds of great sweaters um, and scarves. And it's, 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 just a, it's just a great book. So I'll put a link to that as, as well. I think it's modernlopi.com is the website, but I'll make sure you have the correct um, contact information. Which brings us to our next topic. Which is another, another book, book, another book in the mail. Oh, that's the one you just got mail. Yeah. So, <laughs> so, um, so the, I have a bunch of Arnie and Carlos books and I think I dedicated one of my episodes to Christmas balls knitting with Arnie and Carlos. Mm -hmm. Um, cause I really like their books. I really like them. They're wonderful. Um, and all of my books are in Toronto. And so, and I haven't been to Toronto since March. Uh, so I was having Arnie and Carlos withdrawals, and I think it's a thanks to you, to the to the viewers as well, because a few of you mentioned to me that they're having a knit along, a Christmas ball knit along, oh, okay. and so that got the Arnie and Carlos story clicking in my head, and I thought, okay, well I'm gonna participate that in that, and I think it starts in the beginning of December. I won't be participating because it's too complicated. For oh, me. I've on. seen I've seen you knit ball. I I can't comprehend the four needle thing. It's way beyond what I. It's, I'm sure you can anything, do anything, you can learn anything, but when you, I see these needles going in all directions like this, and I'm like, I, that's just a little too much for me. You can also use two circular needles as well. But, um, yeah, it, well, it, when you, mm -hmm. one day when you have patience, um, I'll sit down and we can go through it. Okay. I teach a class on that. Why don't you just come to my class? <laughs> I'll give you a family discount. <laughs> Anyway, I wanted to point out a couple things that I like about this book. And, well, first thing, I'm going to ask for your opinion on something. Okay. So, uh, there's a picture in here. Mm -hmm. uh, and I want you to tell me your feeling about it. Okay. <laughs> okay, it is here. Hmm. What's the opinion? Well, you tell me your opinion well, of that. That's my next sweater. There's a lot going on here. <laughs> <laughs> it's like this, with this many colors, only much more intricate. So here's what I was thinking about this sweater. 
I am thinking that this sweater would look great if it were in three colors at the most. Um, well, that defeats the whole purpose of the no, sweater. No, 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 like, no, 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 no. There are no. like eight colors there. Here's here's the here's my. So it's not going to look anything like that sweater. No, it will look like this sweater because here's what I would do with this sweater. I think that you need to have a common color running through the sweater. Which and they tried to with red. brown. Well, okay, you said r red. I see more red. See, you've got oh. on the collar, you've got brown, and then you have it on and the wrist, and then the, right here behind and the yellow. But, but it's not see red, through. red, red, and red. Yeah. So I was thinking this would look great in either blue and white, and maybe one other color, or That's black and white and another color. Um, so anyway, I'm gonna play around with this because I this is like a puzzle to me. I'm, I love I, this. The sweater really makes me think, and there's so many possibilities when I see the sweater. Well, I think that's what most, I don't, I don't know, do most people do that? Because that's what I would think, because I would, I would want to change a few things, and well, so far I've, I've made up pretty much a, yeah. anything I've knitted. Um, start with maybe a pattern and an idea, and then you make it your own. Um, or if you love, absolutely love exactly what you see, I think that's more where most people would go, I would think. If they see something they love, they want that. Sweat. I don't know. I think a lot of people knit, they'll read the pattern and knit what the pattern Well, they says. could choose their colors, so they could do the exact pattern and then just, you know, change yeah. it up a little bit with the color, the colors to, to their liking, and they buy the wool that they love, whether it's the type of wool or the colors, and then knit the exact sweater, I yeah. think. And, and so, yeah, I, I'm excited, really excited about this because um, I'm, I'm interested to see what I can do with it. So, okay. Um, and then they've got other things in here too. They've got, they love dolls. They actually, <laughs> if you, if you see some dolls. of the photos of Arnie and Carlos, I think they were at an award ceremony once and they had a seat with one of their dolls beside it. Oh my God. Or his other left. So. Well, I have to say I did stop playing with dolls at about 12. I actually took a class of theirs years ago and it was called Mini Me or Knit Me. Oh, uh, yes, I remember that. <laughs> it, was, it, was actually an, it was actually an excellent class because it taught people how to knit. Like, we had to knit the foot. So the foot was really like a boot or so it was just, yeah. you know, it was, it was like a, yeah, like or a, a sock, a sock. I mean, it was, it was right. just like knitting a sock. So I thought that that was great. Uh, they also have clothing that they knit for their dolls as well, which I think is good because if you want to either uh, if you want to learn how to knit a sweater or other garments, you know, knit a smaller one oh. because then you can okay, that makes get sense. To, and then you can learn um, oh, each aspect of that it. That makes sense. It does. Okay. So they've got their Christmas balls, which is great in here. Um, the other thing that I like is I love this sweater, and it's in a different book. It's not the pattern's actually not in this book, and they're both wearing it. So it's like a teaser. It's a teaser. Yes. <laughs> All <laughs> but those boys. I love this sweater. I I think it's beautiful. I love it. I, I do like that. It's it's really nice. See, I like that. It's intricate, but just the two colors. Yeah. Um, yeah. It was probably that sweater that made me think about doing something with the other. And see, then Is that they wore it again one? there. Yep. And actually, the wrist the wrist warmers he wears. I've knit those in one of their classes as well. Oh, you did. I did see those. Yeah. Um, do you think they're just they each have one of those sweaters, or they're just he has it on there and he and he has it on in this photo? I don't know. I'm not sure. The other thing I wanted to talk about in this book is the pattern for dogs. Dog patterns. Okay. Yeah. I had a look at that and I thought to myself, I love these colors, if you could see that. Yeah. You said that you wanted to knit a sweater there. Yeah. With gray and pink with one of your pinks. I think it would be amazing. And then we thought about it for about a minute and thought, if we were to knit that for our giant poodle, that would be like, <laughs> you know, eight skeins a yard. It would be, you know probably a, a size large for a big dog. Yeah, he would take a lot of yarn. That'd be yeah. a very expensive sweater, although you have yarn that we could use. Yeah. yeah. So would you do the dominant color pink or the dominant dominant color gray? Oh, gray. Okay. Yeah, or brown. Brown and pink would look amazing. Oh yeah, that would but look I love nice the gray. too. That combination would look nice. So, and they've got scarves in here. They've got all kinds of things, but it's, it's great. Um, really, really nice patterns. So I guess with my creativity, could I just take that dog sweater pattern? It does have two arms. Could I just fan dangle it into a sweater for myself? Yes, of course. Yep. <laughs> Remember? I could, I Why could not? Do I could do the <laughs> Yeah, map. because they have the charts here for the sweater. So you just convert the chart to uh, an adult sweater and you're okay. And then you're all done. Except I'll be walking around like this. <laughs> You'll be walking around with your heads like this. <laughs> I don't think it's going to work that way. <laughs> How would you cook? You'd have a difficult time cooking with a sweater on. Cooking? 
Uh, speaking of cooking, yeah. Are you done with the book? I am. Yes, <laughs> yes. That was the that was my subtle intro into what's in your kitchen. Okay. Jamie, what are you making? Well, I'm going to do the pie crust for my French Canadian tortiere, and I'm using this recipe for the pie crust, which is probably about like 45 years old. It's my sister's recipe from her home economics class from like 1960 something. And what's interesting, I copied it down on this little card that I remember from my grade six class and it has an expression on it at the front of it. And it says in French, des nuages roses flanent dans le ciel, which translates to the rose colored clouds um, dawdle in the sky. Anyway, the no-fail recipe. Is so all you need to do is you take five cups of flour, that's four, that's five, and then you add a teaspoon of baking powder and a teaspoon of salt. So just do a little of that and a teaspoon of salt and and then you're going to add, that was a, not a teaspoon, that was a half a teaspoon. Oh my gosh. See when I'm in a hurry? Put that in there. And then, normally you should probably sift it, but these days, if you just kind of do a little bit of mixing with one of these, it's just as good to get as a full blended in there. And then after that, you just add um, lard, which my mother always swore by. Why am I wearing these? Just my mother always swore by tender flakes, so I use it every time because that's what she used. So all you do is then you chop this up and you blend it in with the flour. Okay, where are we with the meat pies? Oh, well, have a look. We're just um, doing a little bit of onion, sauteing mm -hmm. a little bit of onion. Sounds good. And then all we do after that is a little bit of onion. We're gonna add ground pork, mm -hmm. just ground pork. Some people think like, oh yeah, they do ground pork with ground beef. Ew, no, traditional ground pork. It smells so good. Are you going to share it with everyone now or are you going to keep it to yourself? <laughs> no, it's right here. <laughs> okay, here we have it. Oh my gosh, this thing weighs about five pounds. So, mm. there you have it. Tourtière, French-Canadian tourtière, which is 
basically a pork meat pie, but with a long tradition and a bit of a history to it. So basically, this is one of my grandmother's recipes. My mother made them all the time. Every Christmas, it's a tradition. Um, the Christmas tradition is they have what's called a réveillon, which réveillon means awaken or wake up or stay awake because you would have to go to midnight mass and after the midnight mass you'd have this amazing big feast and this was especially made during those festivities. So I did mention how it's made um, and to be enjoyed over the Christmas holidays. And I think because I went... But we're going to enjoy this one tonight. We're going to enjoy this one tonight because... <laughs> Just check it. I, yeah, because I popped a couple of the other ones in the freezer, which usually you pre, you know, you make them ahead of time. My mom would make like about a dozen of them and they'd be stacked in the freezer and we'd have them all through the holidays. You know, family, friends would come over. Did you out, ever sneak pull a, out a piece? Pull out a tortiere. What do you mean? <laughs> like when your mom was out. No. Did you ever go in and... <laughs> Take no. a bite out. We're not allowed. I have a, I have a, I have a story about Christ that. They're for Christmas. So when, when my, when I was younger, uh, my parents bought um, donuts. And Christmas donuts. A dozen, no, a dozen donuts. And so my sister was much younger at the time, and she went and she licked the chocolate off oh the donuts. You, it was probably <laughs> you. He's changing the story. And she no, because the evidence was still on her face when they asked her if she did it or not. Oh my so God. that's what made me think. Did you ever try to eat no. any of the pie? No, but my no. sister, my sister had this fantastic recipe uh, from eons ago from our home ec class, as I mentioned earlier about this pie with the dough. Now she would make this chocolate sheet sheet cake and um you made it in this chocolate flat. sheet <laughs> you make it in this pan and stick it in the oven it was just this hot on the stove and you pour the hot liquid in the hot um chocolate over top of it i don't even know how it's made i attempted it before and it just never worked out and then it's so big because it's made with the big you know a, a roast not a roasting pan but like a sure. cookie sheet like a lasagna sheet? no like oh. a cookie sheet this Huge cookie sheet. It's made on that uh, on the cookie sheet. Oh wow! And then so you'd store it in the oven because there was nowhere to put it to keep it, so it'd stay in the oven. So when I got up in the morning, of course, I'd sneak down there and open up that oven door. Did you get caught? Well, who else is eating the cake when I'm up at the dawn <laughs> eating the chocolate cake? I thought you'd blame it on your sister. It's breakfast cake. That's where my breakfast cake oh, tradition started. Oh, I see. Yeah. So it started at an early age. So can I mention something else about the tortilla? Absolutely. <laughs> Speaking of cake, well, it's, <laughs> it's pie. Same it's pie. Thing. So, it's decorated with the traditional. You probably can't. I don't know if you can see that. We'll take a picture and put it. Yeah, on. for but sure. Right in the center, it's decorated with the fleur de lis, which is like the flower is like the lily, and that is a traditional French royal emblem. Now that tradition goes back to probably about 1297 with King Louis the Ninth of France. Oh. He was canonized and became became Saint Louis and the Fleur de Lis um, was representative of everything French and France and um, he also when the kings of France were crowned they were actually elected and crowned through God and their powers owing to God and there's a symbol when you see uh, kings with this sort of a, a fiery flame that's similar to the fleur de lis above their heads, which symbolize, which symbolizes everything French and France and the supremacy of France. And if you think of a later Canadian history, when um, Jacques Cartier first landed in Canada in the early 1500s on the East Coast, he erected a they say it's a cross, but I think it wasn't necessarily. He erected this sign, which was on a post, but it had a carved fleur de lis with the uh, long live the king of France did he carved land into in, it. Did he land in Newfoundland? Or is it Newfoundland, Newfoundland, and Gatsby. And so he went from Newfoundland Gatsby, to Gatsby Newfoundland. and raised the same sign up on both of those. And about a hundred years later, when Samuel de Champlain came to Canada, now this is now in the early 1600s, he came to Canada several times and he founded Quebec City in 1608 and again the fleur-de-lis plays an important role because it only became um, 
a pure symbol of French supremacy following his last voyage. And there was an expression which said, oh, the return of the fleur de lis, the return of the lee, the lily, which was the French supremacy. And so in the early, early um, reign of King Louis XIV, around 1633, the emblem uh, then became uh, a national symbol of the New World, New France, um, owned and possessed by France. And there you have it. And then later on, around the same period, the governor Frontenac of uh, Quebec then proclaimed the liberty of New France and to bear royal arms against anything um, to stay true to France and anywhere that the fleur-de-lis crossed a beaver and two moose. Liberty what? and arms. So that would be anywhere in Canada is basically what he was saying. And there you have it. Oh, and I'm going to mention one other little bit about the fleur-de-lis because for our American friends, um, the fleur-de-lis is also the symbol of New Orleans saints. And oh why I know that is because <laughs> I have a Quebec hat with the fleur-de-lis and I wear it. It's one of my favorite hats. You got me that as a gift and I love it. And it has the fleur-de-lis. Well, everywhere I'm out and about places and people are like, Oh, so sorry to hear about the saints. I don't know when year they <laughs> fell off the wayside. I'm like, saints, what are you talking about? I don't even know. I'm like, what do they play? But I did find out because I looked it up. Football? <laughs> <laughs> okay, football. So, New Orleans. And that's because the Acadians from the east coast of Canada during, um, you know, when the British took over, when the British won one of the wars, and then the Acadians were, were exiled. The French, some of them were exiled. And actually, well, we won't talk about the negative. They were... Some of them were exiled, but some of them just fled to Louisiana, which was still very French. And to this day, the Acadians and the Creole, descendants of the French, a lot of them originally coming from Canada. And there you have it, the right. New Orleans Saints. And they used the symbol of the fleur-de-lis, and it still means it's the royal emblem of France. Yeah. And there you have, have it. Have you been there? Have you been to New Orleans? I need to go there. We're going to definitely need to go there. I... Um... It's, it's who doesn't want to go for it's a carnival. Well, they also have donuts that you'd love there as well. Oh gosh! But um, yeah, it's a fun city, and I expect the donuts. And then have I'll, a, yeah, a you, you can have a hurricane uh, drink that they serve down there as well, which is knocked me off my feet. Okay, um, there you have it. I'll wear my All Saints hat <laughs> to New Orleans. Do you know what happened that day? So the next day, oh, when gosh, I was down there, <laughs> I was staying. I was down there for a conference, and. I was staying in a really nice hotel, and and then what happened? And then oh, I was, uh, but my meetings didn't start until noon, and and so oh, and so, so you could sleep in or I, stay out well, late. Well, oh my gosh, mm. I was out late, and I woke up in my room. I don't know what time it was, maybe ten o'clock, and a maid came in to clean my room. The maid came in. I was standing there in my boxers, and so were you I, wearing boxers? Well, I don't know, and I apologized. And she said, no need to apologize. That's the best thing I've seen in a long time. <laughs> Is that what the, I'm sure that's what they all say. <laughs> but oh my gosh, your shirt I was laughing I so much. Your shirt already. <laughs> oh my goodness. It was, it was funny. That so we been, both laughed. That would have been very funny. It was so hilarious. that's your New Orleans experience. That's my New Orleans experience. Yes. Um, <laughs> anyway, no, no, I have a question oh. about your pie though. Okay. So did they always use pork? Oh, well, traditionally, I could tell you that this pork tortier, traditionally, um, it's meats. And this recipe goes back to uh, the 1600s. And I think that traditionally, I know that with my grandmother and on the French-Canadian side, pork was sort of a staple. I don't know if it was because you can raise pigs inexpensively or what have you. And I know that my grandmother used to make another dish, which was called a stew with pet de cochon, which is like the pig's feet stew, which you're kind of going, ew, but then I guess all of that meat, they use everything. So they had pork on hand, but some people add to it, um, sometimes beef or wild game or what have you. Now, there is a history that says perhaps the tortillard, the name coming from uh, tort, which is in French, the passenger pigeon. And oh, I yeah. guess in the um, 1800s, the passenger pigeons like flew overhead by the Billions, literally. With or without the notes? They didn't. They were not the same pigeons. Oh, okay. These were the passenger pigeons who, that are now extinct because of uh, over... over um, eating them in pies. 
Exactly. And I know that on the Ile d'Orléans, which is in the St. Lawrence, it was one of the nesting grounds for these. But you could literally, they were so apparently very slow. And I mean, by the gazillions in the air, they were very easily catched. And it was a staple of their food back then. Um, and but I think traditionally just different different meats that you have on hand, you put right. in there. But a staple would be pork and with a few herbs and spices. Um, and this tradition continues to today and everybody has a variation of a meat pie but I think tortillard if you say the word tortillard it's not like your traditional meat pie that you would have like they compare it maybe to a, a, a kidney um, steak and kidney pie for, let's say as a staple in British this sure. is very unique to the French and to Quebec and are we gonna put the recipe in the show notes I'm going to Maybe. say, no, I'm going to say yes, because we will hear about it if we don't. So I think I'm so going to have share which I'm, And I'm glad we do. Oh. So I will definitely put it there. And before I forget, if you remember this from one of the last episodes. Chow last Chow? Episode, it's Chow Chow. Oh, Chow Chow. It's Chow Chow. Yes. It's, it's green tomato Chow Chow. It's like a, a, a relish. It's like sweet, sour, a little bit sweet, a little sour. And you use this as a relish, and it's always traditionally made at the end of the season with your unripened tomatoes left on the vine you would make this green tomato ketchup and it's traditional to have it with the tortilla yeah so if you like relish on your hamburgers or other things you'd like this <laughs> and some people would just be it's such a full pub but they would actually have their meat pie with ketchup just wrong i well i like it with gravy and no oh i love it with gravy it's, it's so like, good with gravy that's not tortiera that's yes it is that's like no 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 no. i don't know what it is <laughs> so there you have it tortiera that's i guess i've anglicized it and crew yeah. anyway so so that's so that's what we're having for tonight yes okay should we go on to finished objects fo <laughs> 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 I didn't mean that. Did you look at me when you said that? Or... That's just wrong. F O, because it's just funny. Mm -hmm. Oh, I love these hats. Oh yeah, that's the fin <laughs> the finishing touch. Is that, isn't it? That's the crowning glory right there. You've perfected. So I've talked about this hat a while yeah, uh, for you've a while. That pattern. Um, I'm still tweaking it. So this pattern is going to be out in September. September. In, in January. This pattern's going to be out in January of, of, of 2021. Um, and it is, I've talked about this in earlier episodes. The pattern is called Winter Kept Us Warm. Oh, that's right. But I'm just sorry I'm laughing because it's like, how come I have the girl? Because <laughs> I was the one handing it out. <laughs> Isn't it your niece? Isn't, did your niece draw the. I thought you did. Face? I but, did not. I think it was oh. Avery, your niece. Oh. So the, the yarn that I used is from, <laughs> that's Zan. He's, a, he's a, either laughing at us or approving what we're saying. Or time to go make or, a sandwich. Don't say that or go run for his food. Um, so this is the, a, the, the oak that I used. So I used the um, oak bark and the acorns and the leaves and, and dyed the yarn with it. And, uh, um, and that's turned into that beautiful golden color. I like that you've done the opposing hats because you could really see the contrast between the gold and this um, this beautiful brown, which is like a, what would you call that brown to describe it? It's not dark brown. It's like a medium, it's like a medium, it's, it's gorgeous. And I particularly love the gold. Yeah, which one do you like better? Well, I like this one because I like the gold. Well, they're both gold, cool, yeah. And it's on the she. So like, it's on the she mannequin. Yes, <laughs> the she head. We have to name her. Can I say that? The yeah, the she mannequin. <laughs> In the he mannequin. Oh my gosh. Um, I'm not going there. Not going there. Uh, so anyway, so the, 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 we've decided to. Uh, I decided to just switch them, but they mm -hmm. are gender gender neutral hats. So yeah, they are. I actually. <laughs> I'm not sure if you can hear that of our dog is chatting or adding to the peanut gallery over here. Um, so I made this one for my daughter, and so she wore that on the weekend. Um, I was just testing it out. So I'm just tweaking the pattern, and then that will be ready to go. Fantastic. And speaking of what's in my oh. dye pot. Oh, yeah. We have to show that as well. So, so this okay. was a dye pot that I talked about a couple of episodes ago, and I just, I was yellowed out. 
So yes. I've done a lot of yellow and the acorn um, and the bark and the leaves kind of broke that up. But I still, I had so much cannabis d um, dyed yarn that I wanted to do something with it. And it's great. Yellow is a fantastic base for, for to add other colors. And um, I've added cochineal to, to give a fantastic orangey color to it. Uh, but this time I decided to use indigo. And so here it is. So that's the um, cannabis, and just as the cannabis died. Mm -hmm. And so then I added indigo, and I love playing with indigo, and I love playing with color with indigo. And so, um, do you want to hold that, that one up beside it? Amazing. And then this one. So this dye pot had more indigo in it than this one. And this, if you can make it out, is almost like a very fluorescent green like a yeah, lime yeah, fluorescent lime yeah. green from natural dye it's amazing uh -huh. and and as you mentioned we talked about that before when you have a really great yellow base like a deep rich yellow um you could get a lot of well any color yeah. you'll get the next step or the next color is going to be as rich or yeah. or deep and rich in color because of your base color and this one being yellow this one kind of reminds me of um kind of worn jeans or something like that yeah, so, I you know can what see I mean? that. So, and so what I do is, there's just so many variables to impact color. There's the amount of indigo that's in it. It's whether where it is in the line of, is it a fresh uh, vat? Is it been exhausted? And then the duration of time or the number of dips that you put in yeah. it. And so um, I love playing with that and yeah. getting getting these colors. So And this is, and it's always, it's, it's always very, not necessarily tricky, but it's it's tricky but precise. Because you know that if you want to replicate the exact color, like you did with this one, for example, then you need to do exactly what you did to get several yeah. of this exact color, which you did. And then this one as well, and I don't know which one was more exhausted or not exhausted. I think the more blue, obviously, would be the fresher batch yes. of indigo. Yep. And then as it wears, and you want a little less of the color to create this paler green. Yeah. But the underlying yellow, I think, is what makes it Yes. pop like this fluorescent color. The other thing I just wanted to point out was that this is the first yarn this is to come out of the indoor studio. Well, somewhat indoor studio. <laughs> I mean, so Jamie was Jamie area. was nice enough to clear out one of the garage bays and convert it into uh, retrofit it into a um, like a studio. And so I it's, I've moved the outdoor studio now into the inside for the winter, but I still will be doing larger pots. Anything that I can boil over a flame, that will be outside. Uh, but the other stuff is inside right now. So yeah. thank you for that. Because it was, it's you were, perfect. Well, you were on the veranda and you did a lot of that. It was French porch. It was you know, front up. porch dying. Yes. <laughs> Which is great. Yeah. And it's great for your videos. And you still do your videos out there. In, but in the garage, I yeah, I insulated part of the garage and then cleared moved stuff into from that storage area you're just shifting stuff around this full of stuff um but there's a big you got a big harvest table in there yeah we got a heater there is one vent but not quite enough to keep it that well it's good for now i guess i mean when it goes minus like, 20 yeah then, then uh, that might be in trouble it's not gonna be minus 20 in there it'll be nice and cozy and, and a, a good working space yeah but you insulated the walls and all that stuff too which is great yeah yeah so anyway, it's it's. Uh, I, I, I just, love it there. I do more than just talk history and bake <laughs> and bake. <laughs> Zane, your tail's in the camera. <laughs> okay, now it is time for our giveaway. And so, from the last episode, um, we did ask about comments. Did we not? Yes. So we, we did. mentioned. So how it went was. Will you explain? How did this? How did it go about? We wanted was, to do a giveaway because it's been a while since we did a giveaway. But also, um, people were asking about uh, where you can, where, where can I buy the yarn? And so, um, the website is not up yet. Um, we're close. We're close, and we have been. We've been sidetracked on participating in other vendor type activities. Yes. And so. I thought, you know, why don't we just do this? And plus, I want to hear what people are knitting over the holidays. And so, and you, you're, we had a lot of comments. 
Yes. Um, and it seems like a lot of people are doing knitting for others, and they're doing scarves and hats, and some are getting sweaters as well. That's really nice. Um, I did want to point out uh, that Katrina Baird, she had a couple of, uh, I thought were, were great ideas, or some things that she's knitting. One of them is a toque, that, and you're using the scraps from the toque, and it's called um, the Scrappy Marl Hat. And it's oh. by okay. Pieta Jezek, and it's free pattern. So I will definitely put a link to that. But you can use and all your scraps. Oh, okay. and, and I think it's such a great idea. Because some people, I mean, they might do um, dryer balls or different things yeah. that you could do with, with ends. Um, but why not? I mean, people have so much leftover bits of yarn from projects that if you can knit a, a full hat that takes exactly those bits and makes them to, into a wonderful pattern yeah. hat, um, there you have it. Yep, it's fantastic. And the other one, the other pattern that she told me about was Snap by Snap. Tin, tin Can Knits, and it's the same concept. That one, that pattern is not free. I think it costs five dollars um, you know, on Ravelry, but I'll put a link to both of them. And what's the Snap pattern? Snap. That's what it is. No, it uses this. It, it uses the end. I don't know. I didn't read the pattern. I looked at it. I didn't read it. So maybe it explains it, or you can tell us what the Snap means. Um, okay, so now's the time. So this is how it's going to work. Okay. I'm going to go through the comments, and um, I'm just going to go from the top to the bottom, count-wise, and I'm going to ask Siri to give me a random number, 1 to 68, and mm. then um, I'll just count down, and that will be the winner. Okay. And, do I know Siri? Um, yeah, I think she you do. Is she a friend of mine? She's probably... <laughs> Everyone's yeah. friend. Okay, so... Um, okay. Do I need glasses? Siri, you can't talk while I'm talking to Siri because then she'll pick up her voice too and she will confuse her. Okay. Okay. <laughs> oh, let me answer your question first. No, you don't need glasses. I'll, I'll wear the glasses. Unless you want to read it. And then you'll need glasses. Siri, provide me with a random number between 1 and 68. Now she's pissed off with me. Siri, provide me with a number between 1 and 68. <laughs> 18. Okay. She doesn't say it? No, no, she's she's I, she I think she's pissed. To you. She's pissed with us. Uh, so 1 Let 2 3 4 5 6 Did you say 18? 7 8 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. Um, okay, the winner is Heather Evertston. Um, and Heather is knitting uh, lots of slippers for her nieces and nephews. And she's casting on for hats and mitts. So Heather... And projects for the whole family. Yep, so Heather, congratulations on that. Uh, Heather, send me, I, what I'll do is I'll put my contact information in here, my email address, and send me an email and with your address, and we will send you these skeins of yarn. So there you have it. Heather Evertson, you get these. And they're beautiful, and I love them, and I want them. <laughs> um, so thank you. We want to thank everybody for their commentary. Absolutely. Because, um, you know, the more that people comment, we love reading them, you love reading them, you love responding to them. And uh, nice to know that everybody out there is just uh, knitting away for family, friends, gifts for themselves. Yep. And um, yeah, thanks for participating. Yeah, and, and I love the comments as well. And, and I would just like to say, if there's anything that you want to see that, we're not, that we haven't covered, uh, we're open to suggestions all the time. History and wool, or any history. <laughs> yeah, history and wool. I know stuff. Well, I've, I've talked a little bit about the history of Canada, and we haven't really talked about that, and, and it's a um, relationship with wool. There's so much to dig oh, in there. Oh, there is. And yeah. in Europe, and in North America, like, there's all kinds of stuff to talk about. So, uh, fire off the topics. That's for another day. That's for another day. So, what's coming up? I'm the last to know. You know that. I'm always the last <laughs> to know, so you tell me. Okay, one of the events what is... What am I doing tomorrow? <laughs> yeah, so one of the events is Knit Escape, and Knit Escape starts on December 3rd, 4th, and 5th. And is this with... Christy Glass okay, is, yes. is, is a part yes. of this, um, 
And so I think she's one of the co um, people behind it. Fantastic. And we, so love, be, we love we love Christy Glass. Have you seen her latest picture? It's Which one? Awesome. Oh, I don't think you've seen it yet. <laughs> you have to look at it. It's, it's, <laughs> okay. it's really good. I know we just we, it's it's Vogue worthy. It's really oh, okay. good. I know it's that awesome. we just revisited her 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 Santa baby Christmas. Oh yes, so that that kicked off. Her, amazing. That kicked off that, the holiday that, season. Why is that not gone viral? She's gorgeous. She's talented. And she can sing. I'm and uh, so wonderful. I the love are great. that she changed the lyrics. That's all about knitting. If you haven't seen it, Christy Glass, um, Santa baby. I feel a performance coming Down on. The chimney <laughs> tonight. Not the same. I also want to mention that uh, another uh, Christy Glass interview that just happened last week, and okay. that is with Earth Tone Girl. Oh, and it's really good. And the reason why it is so good is because Earth Tone Girl is she loves what she does she loves she, she, talk, she talks about everything related to um, socks and, oh. and making socks and it's so interesting and her passion definitely comes out when she's talking about that she's also does massage massage yeah and this is this is i found this so fascinating With because <laughs> yeah she was like well it, yes the answer is yes but she does massage people as well and so christy asked you know is there a connection between like do you feel your wool when you're oh, and it's so interesting very sort of maybe sensitive yes fingers to well touch. but the thing is like you, there's the want to touch like do you oh. and so i touch well a couple things one i've always thought about being a massage therapist in like as a as a side gig okay. I, I love that whole thing i love um both the giving and the receiving but okay. i also touch all of my wool i touch all of it like i you see me every night um going through and putting these into skeins because i love touching it um so i'm a very tactile person and so there's definitely a correlation between massage and um wanting yeah. to feel feel the wool yeah and you see that all the time when you're at festivals and and events because people yeah. are are literally massaging the wool when they're deciding what to choose because there's so many um variables but i think the one in common is the touch yeah but don't over massage the wool because that's never good either or the product or the finished product <laughs> you don't want to felt it <laughs> the, <laughs> the friction of your head <laughs> if the wool starts to felt in your hands put it down or it's yours but just like, <laughs> that's right it's <laughs> just like it's if you felt it you bought it <laughs> exactly exactly do not over feel the product that's right please okay so back to knit escape <laughs> So Knit Escape is December 3rd, oh 4th, and 5th, and mm -hmm. there's going to be classes and free stuff as well. Um, yes. There's a knit night, I think, on oh. Thursday. So it starts on Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and um, there's a great farm there as well. It'll be doing a tour of the farm. Um, so, okay. yeah, it's going to be, it's, it's, it sounds like it's really good. I've registered that for it. That sounds great. Yeah, so I'm looking forward to that. And also, um, the whole thing with... Um, Arnie and Carlos and their balls. Yes, <laughs> Arnie and Carlos balls. It's not about your Christmas balls this year. It's about their balls. It's about their balls. Yes. So hopefully, why, I've, why are you blushing? I have registered for it. So hopefully, I will be part. Of, I'm not sure how it works yet, but and I haven't received an email. But we'll see how that happens. But hopefully, um, I can um, do Arnie's and Carlos yeah, balls. Yeah, and we've watched. Uh, many of their episodes and I love they have one of the most beautiful settings. It oh looks my like, gosh It's gorgeous. It looks amazing. I mean, we're we talk about, you know We're so happy to be and lucky to be where we are. Yeah, um, in the cabin in the woods But oh my gosh these these boys and their location and their wonderful lifestyle as well. It's just a it really is just um it's just a pleasure to watch. It really yeah. is. It's like a fantasy. Well, and they're fun too. Like oh. they're they're a lot of fun. You learn a lot. They're very informative. They know what they're doing, and yeah, yeah. And we've got one more thing that we want to talk about. Oh, do you almost forgot? Yeah. Well, I didn't forget. Well, I didn't but even I was... know. <laughs> so December nineteenth, mark it on your calendar. We are going to have a drop in. So it's a holiday festive drop in. So bring your knitting. Bring your favorite drink. And we are going to be in Zoomlandia. I was going to say virtually. Don't just pop into the cabin because... And it'll be Zoom, it will be in Zoomlandia. And we Very will good. be... I will put all the detailed information on it. And we'd love for you to drop in. It's going to be an hour. And we'll see how it goes. Should we be wearing something festive? Well, I think that Santa might pop in or a special guest. 
I think. Our, our viewers going to be, or is everyone joining us? Maybe in pajamas or in no, anything? In know. what? Something fun? Festive. Festive. They're yeah, beautiful. Like a, as opposed to their ugly Christmas sweaters. Are they beautiful? beautiful Christmas yeah, sweaters? that's a good idea. Where are your best knits? Um, to, yeah. So anyway. I wonder that, if people have knitted Christmas sweaters. Like. Yes, absolutely. Like they have. Christmassy with Christmas themes yes. on them. Yep. As opposed to just a regular beautiful sweater. Yeah, for I sure. Yep. I'll leave it up to you. So that will be December 19th, and I will post all of the information on it. Uh, I'll post the time and the link to Zoomlandia and the password. And, okay. And I would love to see to see you there. And so it's, it's just, just a chat. Informal nothing chat. formal. It's an informal chat. Knit along. And bring your knitting. Yeah, absolutely. Bring your holiday okay. knitting. Um, just want to thank everybody for joining us this episode. We always have fun pulling these things together and chatting about knitting and stuff in your kitchen and all kinds of stuff. So just, again, thank you so much for watching. Thank you for your comments as well. There's oh, always I always have a great time responding to them. We'll see you next time. See you next time. Take care. Bye-bye. Is this too much? My shirt. I'm just gonna do a couple of back. <laughs> yeah, one of those subscribers said to get that back. I'm gonna get it. Since you be doing that. Okay.